Hello, my name is Melissa Silvis of Melissa Silvis Ministries, and we're so excited to start a new series this week entitled Integrity. Uh, last week, we finished up a series called Spiritual Intimacy and Spiritual Authority, how to uh, align ourselves with God in an intimate place where our relationship with Him is consistently growing so that when we go out into the world, we're operating in His authority and His power. We're trusting in God and we have a consistent faith testimony before the world. Well, as I prayed and, and contemplated what we were going to study next, I began to think about what one of the um, characteristics of a Christian that we see so lacking in our world today is. And I believe that integrity is one of the most important foundations for us as a Christian, for us to have a consistent testimony before the world, that we're not in the midst of um, good days and good circumstances Circumstances, it's easy to follow Christ, right? It's easy to be pleasant. It's easy to be kind. It's easy to be patient. But what about when life is challenging? What about when you're going through a season when you feel all the circumstances around you are draining you? They're just weighing on you. Well, some people just say, oh, because life is tough, you know, everybody understands if you're having problems and you're struggling in your flesh or whatever. But we can make excuses for ourselves. And so when we look in the Word of God, we see people who have a measure of integrity. But I believe that other than Jesus Christ, who of course was perfect always in his integrity, that one of the people that stands out to me is Joseph in the book of Genesis. And most people know Joseph because they know about Joseph's coat of many colors. They know that his father favored him and put this coat on him to show that he was the favorite. But do you know there's more to the story than why? Jacob gave him that coat just because he was his favorite son. There were other things going on. And so we're going to look into the book of Genesis and we're going to look at this man, Joseph, and the life of integrity that he lived. That whether or not he was going through a season where he had authority and favor with man and it seemed like he had great success, that there are other seasons as well where he was persecuted and uh, he was ridiculed by his brothers because of the uh, desire he had to serve God. And so we're going to look at the life that he lived and the fact that whether or not it was a great season of great success or it was a hard season, at one point even sitting in a prison for a couple of years wondering uh, what was coming next, the thing that never changed in Joseph was his integrity. And that spiritual integrity was not just something he was born with. It wasn't something he just woke up one day decided to have. But instead, it was an intentional strategy on his part to always be trusting God, to always be submitting to God, and to live a life that was above ridicule. Not that people won't uh, poke fun at you or try and say things behind your back that Satan won't try and come and uh, try and ruin your reputation. But when you're a man or woman of integrity, those things can't stick to you because there's absolutely no foundation for them in who you are. So a man or woman of integrity, spiritual integrity, not just integrity like the world thinks integrity, not just honesty that does the right thing when people are watching, but integrity, honesty, even when no one knows what what you're doing, and what's in your heart. That is a continual commitment to God that will keep you spiritually safe from the attacks of Satan, but will also align you with God in a way where he has total access to your life and that whether life is good or life is challenging, God is always seen in you because your integrity never fails, because it's not based on what's going on around you. It's based on what God has put within you. So this is the basic definition of integrity. Integrity is honesty. And honesty is not something that we can compromise. If someone is honest, they have to be honest all the time. Otherwise, they're not honest, are they? Uh, on Integrity also is having strong moral and spiritual principles um, to consistently display the character of Christ. And so the standard of the character of Christ is the one that's set for us, and that's what we must adhere to. Not the life that people tell you is okay for a Christian to live, but the life that consistently honors God. Christ said to his disciples that he came so that the world could see God at work through him.
And so it is the same kind of character that Christ displayed that you and I must consistently display if we are going to be men, women, or young people of integrity. So that people can see the difference between them and us is that we don't live by a shifting moral code that comes and goes based on what we think is right or we want to be right, but instead it's the moral code of what God says in his word. That's our standard. And a man or woman of integrity does not compromise that to please other people, but instead they are consistently displaying the character of Christ and desiring to please God first and foremost in life. Integrity is also to have a whole and undivided loyalty to God, unimpaired in your obedience to him. A lot of people come out of maybe even a background when they were growing up where they became people pleasers. They wanted to please their parents. Maybe there was something um, that was not completely healthy about that relationship or another relationship that they had with an adult. And they grew up thinking that they had to constantly make sure that everybody else was always happy with them all the time. Well, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have a good reputation that is godly and God-honoring. But the problem comes when Satan begins to manipulate us so that the pleasing of man takes a um, precedence over pleasing God. And so we become... Um, upset or distracted or overly concerned when somebody isn't pleased with us. And so we're working hard to make sure everybody's happy with us all the time. And Satan is using that desire to manipulate us. And then the compromise comes because you can't always please people and always please God. There will be a place where there's a fork in the road and you can only please one or the other. And if you're not able to break yourself out of the desire to please men at all times and have everyone think well of you all the time, which can become a, a kind of bondage, if you can't have a full desire just to please God and to allow the ple pleasure of man to go by the wayside, look, when a man pleases God, it says in the word of God, when a man pleases God, that God is able to make even his enemies to be at peace with him. And so you can run around trying to please men all you want, but if you please God, then God can work in that area and he can actually give you favor with that person. But if it takes precedence for you to always have everyone feel you know, good about you and like you all the time, then that will be something that drives you and controls you. But a man or woman of integrity wants to please God and understands that sometimes in pleasing God, you will displease men. They won't be happy with you because you don't do what they want you to do. But God can break you free from that bondage to always have everybody have to feel well about you, to understand that when I please and I honor God, that's where my spiritual integrity and loyal, loyalty lies. It lies with God. And when I please God, that I'm making an investment in an eternal kingdom. I can please somebody today and then tomorrow they want me to do something else and then the next day they want me to do something else and they say, oh, you know, I won't be happy if you don't do this and maybe they don't actually say it but just in the way that they treat you and they're manipulating the situation and the relationship. God will never manipulate you to get you to do what he wants you to do. He simply makes covenant promises with us and he says, if you do this, then it will make the way for me to be able to do this and God always keeps his promises. And a relationship with him is built on not only his integrity, but it's built on our integrity in response to his. He is totally loyal to us at all times. And he requires total loyalty from those who really are his sons and daughters. And lastly, integrity is defined as internal consistency that protects one from being easily corrupted. Integrity will keep you doing the right thing even when Satan tries to tell you, no one will ever know. Integrity will keep you sound and safe in your accountability and your loyalty to God, even when there could be possibly a guarantee that no one would ever find out that you said that thing or that you did that thing. But you know what? God will know and you will know. So in your integrity, you will walk rightly before God 
because your greatest desire at all times is to honor God, to please God, to give God glory with your life. And you have to have that kind of mindset because if integrity isn't important to you, then you'll, it will come and go. And it's not really integrity if it's not consistent. And so people will do the right thing when it pleases them to do the right thing. And then they'll do the wrong thing when it pleases them to do the wrong thing. And that lack of consistency in integrity will not just affect your life, but it will affect the lives of your children, of your grandchildren, of the people around you. One person who lives a life of integrity can change a nation. That's what we're going to find out about Joseph's life. But one person who doesn't walk in integrity can cause chaos in their family. And that's what we see in the generation prior to Joseph's. Look, uh, Joseph was the fourth in line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. And Abraham walked with God. He was a friend with God. But there were things Abraham did that were compromises in his integrity. When God said, I will give you a son of promise. And he will be, you know, the foundation of a great nation. When Abraham's wife came to him and said, you know, I, I want to have a child now. Here's my handmaiden. Go in and sleep with her and give me a son. Um, she was, you know, willing to kind of try and go her own way. And Abraham didn't fight her on it. He didn't and stand in his integrity and say, we will wait for the hand of God to move on our behalf. And so they made a mistake, and that mistake caused a son to come forth through her handmaiden, who after he arrived, she didn't want anymore, and she treated her handmaiden and the child badly, and because she compromised herself. And after that child came, she realized that wasn't the child of promise. And so she wanted them to go, and she wanted Abraham to send them away, and she wanted to treat them badly. And Abraham even said, do what you think is right to your handmaiden. And she treated her badly, and she didn't feel bad about it. But God took care of that child and of his mother. But the point is, is that Abraham and Sarah compromised themselves. And then along came Isaac. And Isaac had a beautiful wife, Rebecca, and they had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the younger of the two. They were twins. And Jacob is the father of Joseph, whose life we're going to look at. But Jacob and Esau came out, and Jacob wanted what Esau had. As the firstborn son, he had the birthright, the right to a double portion of inheritance of his father's wealth. The problem with Esau's integrity is that he did not value what was given to him. Esau rightly should have been the next one in line. It should have been Abraham and Esau and then whoever Esau's son was. But because Esau did not value his birthright, that legacy of faithfulness to God that Abraham wanted to pass down through Isaac to Esau, it went by the wayside. We, we read in Genesis that Jacob um, swindled Esau out of his birthright for a bowl of porridge. Wait till he came back from being out in the field and was hungry. And he bought his brother's birthright. And it was because Esau didn't value what was given to him that Jacob was able to swindle him. And so we see envy and manipulation and jealousy in their relationship. Later on, when Isaac, the father, became very ill and was near to death, uh, Jacob's mother, Rebecca, helped him to deceive his father, to think that he was Esau, and to give him the blessing of the firstborn son. Well, after it all came out, Esau sought to take Jacob's life. And Rebekah told Jacob to go and to marry a wife among her people in Haran, where her brother Laban and his family still lived. So this is where we pick up the story of Joseph. And we begin in Genesis chapter 28 with the story of, of Joseph's father, Jacob. But right before we get there, I want to talk a little bit more about integrity to set the stage for understanding what integrity is and what integrity isn't because we're going to see both examples in Jacob and in his generation as we go into the scripture here. But before we get there, I want to share a couple of scriptures out of the New Testament with you. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3, and it reads this way. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, 
all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation, if you have tasted that the Lord is good. For a man or woman to walk in integrity, they have to do what Peter has written here. You have to put aside all malice. That means all desire to do evil. All deceit, which is deceiving or misrepresenting the truth or exaggeration. A lot of people are given to exaggeration. When I was young, I had a problem. I was a habitual liar. And most of my lies were lies of exaggeration, which people may call white lies. But there is no such thing as a white lie or a black lie. There is just a lie. So putting aside our exaggeration, hypocrisy, which is claiming to have beliefs or moral standards that your behavior do not actually conform to. You hear out in the world that they say that there are a lot of people that are hypocrites in the church. Sadly, this is true. This is true. Not that this is justification for somebody to not go to church because you go to church to be with God. But the problem is, is that it is true. There are a lot of people walking in hypocrisy in the body of Christ. They say that they are Christ Christians. They claim to have beliefs or moral standards that their behavior does not actually conform to. So what comes out of their mouth and how they live their life is not consistent. With a man or woman of integrity, it's always consistent who they say they are, you watch them walk it out in their life, and that's who they are. On an easy day, on a hard day, on a good day, on a bad day, in an easy season where everything seems to go right, in a challenging season where there seems to be uh, spiritual attacks, maybe physical attacks, relationships are broken. A man or woman of integrity is not a hypocrite. If they say they trust in God, you see them trust in God. Where a lot of hypocrisy comes out is because it exposes what's really in a person's heart. We see this a lot online in social media, where one day somebody is sharing a scripture and they're praising God for what he did. And the next day they are slandering their neighbors. They're talking about the person down the street whose car was uh, blocking their driveway. Maybe the person doesn't live in your neighborhood. Maybe they don't know what they were doing. Maybe there was an emergency. You know, we are so easy to become offended and angry. It's like everybody's walking around all the time just waiting for somebody to step on the edge of their toes so they can let it fly because then they think they're justified. That's a hypocrisy. That's a hypocrisy because those who want to grow up into maturity in God and in their salvation... Look, it takes a lot of humility to be a man or woman of integrity. And I'm not saying it's right when people don't do the right thing. But if the only time you do the right thing is when other people do the right thing, that's not integrity. Integrity says that whether or not you keep your word, I'm keeping my word because I didn't make my promise to you. I made my promise to God. And so you put away all hypocrisy because then people may say, oh, there are hypocrites in the church. But you know what? They can't ever say it about you, can they? Because who you are in person, who you are online, who you are when you think no one is looking. A man or a woman of integrity is always the same person. You always get the same person, the same attitudes, the same actions because they are fueled and they are led by the Spirit of God. And that doesn't ma mean that we never get it wrong. You know, everybody is susceptible to letting their flesh get the best of them. But what I'm saying is a man or woman of integrity is consistently the same person. And when they do get it wrong, their integrity makes them immediately take responsibility for it. They're not blaming somebody else. But they're saying, it's me. I, I was wrong. That's integrity. Also, they put aside all envy. They have no desires to have what someone else has instead of them having it. Envy and jealousy fuel a lot of what people do that's wrong. They covet what belongs to someone else. They don't just want it too. They want it instead of that person. Like Jacob did to Esau. Jacob didn't just want to be blessed by his father. He wanted to be blessed by his father instead of his older brother. And that's why he went and he deceived him and he took his birthright. And lastly, we must put away all slander, false accusations against someone's character. 
A lot of people are happy to try and find something in your life that they think is not consistent with who you say you are. They're just a little bit happy when they don't like you if they find out something not nice about you and they want everybody to know. See, you're not really as godly as you say you are. And that's why when somebody moves away from integrity, away from a God-centered life of total obedience, as soon as they do something wrong, the enemy's right there to exploit it and he wants everybody to know because he wants to shame you and he wants to cast dirt on the character of Christ. But your integrity is going to protect you when you make the right choices to not be seen somewhere where it could be misconstrued that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing or you're somewhere where you shouldn't be to begin with. Don't give the enemy any room to attack you. That's why it says in the word of God we're to abstain from all appearance of evil. Because we're supposed to protect our reputation. We're supposed to be protecting the reputation of Christ in us. And so integrity gives us a standard to hold ourselves to that helps us. So we're not falling into hypocrisy. We're not falling into deceit. We're not falling into envy. And we're not going into gossip and slander to harm somebody else's reputation just because somebody said look I can't tell you how many times I go online and I read something online that's about somebody maybe in public life and political arena in the government it's somebody that people don't like and they're happy to believe every lie about them but a man or a woman of integrity keeps themselves free from slander. They don't jump on the bandwagon and start talking bad about someone just because they know everybody else is going to like that post. Yeah, we don't like that person, so we like to hear that there's something else they're doing wrong. We like to hear that they said that. Not because we want to pray for them and we want to see them come to know God as their Lord and Christ as their Savior. No, we want to slander them because we want everybody to think badly about them. If you want anybody to think badly about someone, and I'm not talking about holding people accountable so that people are protected from what somebody is and what somebody does, but I'm saying if you're going around trying to ruin somebody's reputation just because it makes you feel good to have everybody else look badly at that person, that's slander, and that's not integrity. And when you compromise your integrity before God, you compromise your ability to be blessed by God and to see God work in and through your life, and you will be held accountable because you wasted the resources that God gave you, where you should have been building the kingdom of God. Every time you slander someone, every time you gossip, every time you're deceitful, every time you're envying, every time you're hypocritical, you're not building the kingdom of God. You're knocking down the things that have been built in your life. And people wonder why they never progress in their relationship with God. And because they build up a little bit and then they destroy it all. That's why there has to be a consistent integrity in the way that you live your life. It isn't about what people are trying to provoke in you. It's about the strength of God within you that says, I won't be easily offended. I won't be unforgiving. I won't retaliate. I'm not vindictive. And that's when Christ will really be seen in you because there's that consistent testimony of how he's changed you and made you so resilient in a variety of different situations. Jacob fled his home and he had not done right. He had sinned. He'd not had a right relationship with God. Philippians 2, 12 through 16 reads this way. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to do and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. Ouch. That's hard, but it's right. If you're going to be a man or woman of integrity, you got to stop grumbling, stop arguing, stop complaining. So that you may be blameless and pure. Children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine like stars in the world, by holding firm to the word of life. A man or woman of integrity holds firm to the word of life. They're not pushed around by the circumstances in life, but instead they are rooted firm on the foundation of obedience and adherence to the word of God continually. 
It's not an easy life to live, but it's possible because God strengthens us and because he gives us the standards that we need to be living to. But Jacob had not been living according to God's standards. He gave God no room to work in his life. He was trying to be selfishly ambitious. He stole the birth ape from his brother. He manipulated his father to bless him. But in the end, none of that was going to matter unless he had the blessing of God on his life, which he didn't have yet. And so Jacob was on his way to Haran, on his way to go to his mother, um, Rebecca's brother's house, Laban's house. And on the way, we see in Genesis 28, 10 through 22, that he stopped in a place to sleep for the night. And this is what we see. We see that he encounters God. He lays down to sleep. He uses a stone for his pillow, and he has his dream. And on a dream, there is a ladder that extends up to heaven, and he sees angels going up and down the ladder. And God comes to the ladder, and God begins to speak to Jacob. And this is what he says. He says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. God always operates in integrity. He doesn't come to Jacob and say, wow, you really blew it. You messed up. Look what you did to your brother. Look what you did to your father. Now you're on the run. This is a real mess you've created. That's not what God said. God wants us to repent of our sin. But God also comes and he speaks words of love and truth to us to show us what life can be when we repent of our sin. And so this is what Jacob's response is. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Until you walk in integrity and obedience to God, you won't see God where he is. God is all around you. He is speaking to you. He's trying to draw you to him. But until you desire to build that relationship with him, like 1 Peter says, to grow up into your salvation, stop being a spiritual baby. Some people have been in the church for 35 years and they're still a spiritual baby because they don't desire the pure milk of the word. They aren't putting their sin away. They aren't dealing with their flesh. They aren't walking in a life of integrity before God. But God was coming to Jacob and say, this is my standard. I want to walk with you. I want to partner with you. I want to protect you. I want to expand you all across the earth and make your descendants, you know, as, as many as the stars in the sky or the sand on the, you know, seashore. You know, I just want to prosper you in an incredible way. But you've got to partner with God if that's going to happen. And so he said, surely God is in this place. But I did not know it. You won't see God until you seek God. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob took that stone he had slept and used for his pillow. And he used it and he built up a pillar. And he renamed this place Bethel, the house of God. A place where Jacob encountered God in a significant way. And God made a promise, a covenant to Jacob. And Jacob responded by making a vow to God as, said, as well. And he said this, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. He was leaving with his family relationships destroyed. But he said, If God will bring me back one day in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give you a tenth. And so Jacob makes a covenant with God. He also, also covenants to tithe a tenth of everything that God gives to him, to God, to honor God with. So he makes that covenant. He says, from this day forward, I will honor God. Jacob made the choice to leave who he was behind to get rid of all that malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander and grow up into a relationship with God that would show that he was a man of integrity. 
Well, as we read on in Genesis chapter 29, 30, and 31, we see that Jacob goes to Haran. And in Haran, he sees his uncle Laban, and he sees that his uncle Laban has two daughters, one named Leah and one named Rachel. Leah was the older and Rachel was the younger. And Jacob falls in love with Rachel. And Jacob goes to Laban and says, I want her as my wife. What do I need to do? And Laban says, oh, you need to work for me for seven years. Now, guys, if you had to wait seven years and work for your father-in-law before you could have your wife as your wife, that's, that's a lot of work. You know, that's a lot to ask. But Jacob was willing to make that investment. He was so in love with Rachel, it says in the word of God, that those seven years were like just a couple of days for him because he was so in love with her and so looking forward to making her his wife. Well, if you know anything about this story, you know that Laban tricked Jacob and he gave him Leah instead. And Jacob got up in the morning and realized that in the evening that his wife had not come into his room, but that, um, well, it was his wife because that's who Laban gave him, but it wasn't Rachel his wife, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, why have you deceived me? Why have you done this? See, Laban was not a man of integrity. And Jacob said, why did you do this to me? And Laban said, look, she's the older daughter. I couldn't give you Rachel to be, you know, he started making all these excuses. When you're not a man of integrity, you will do something deceptive. And then you'll blame other people. You'll make excuses. Well, in our culture, I couldn't give you Rachel to begin with. Well, then why didn't he tell him that at the beginning of the seven years? Because he wanted seven years of labor, out, of labor out of this man. Because when someone sees that you are a person of integrity, of course the enemy will try and manipulate you. People will try and control you. They'll see the goodness of God on your life and they'll try and harness it. Because they won't walk in integrity before God. They think that they can get it vicariously through you. But Jacob was not Laban's fool. Jacob hold, held Laban accountable. And Laban said, look, you know, go out the rest of the wedding week with Leah, and then I will give you Rachel as well. And so one week later, Jacob now had not just one wife, but two wives, but he had to also work another seven years for Rachel. And we don't see Jacob arguing with Laban beyond telling him, why did you deceive me? He, he was a man of integrity. He was willing to work those other seven years because he understood that he wanted to have Rachel as his wife. He was willing to do the hard work for the end result. And many people who, with less integrity would have said, forget you, I'm out of here, you're not manipulating me anymore. But in the end, God would get the glory and God would continue to bless and favor Jacob. And we see that throughout those 14 years, Laban prospered because God blessed Jacob. At the end of those 14 years, Jacob was able to look back and see that he had fulfilled his covenant with Laban. Now, over those 14 years, Jacob's two wives, who were sisters, had battled it out continually. Rachel was greatly loved by Jacob, but Leah was not loved by Jacob at all. And it says in the word of God that when God saw that Leah was unloved, in fact, hated by her sister, he opened up her womb and he made her prosperous and she was able to have children. She had four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah and all that time Rachel was not able to have children and Rachel looked at Leah and she envied her she had jealousy in her heart toward her sister and she went to Jacob and said Jacob give me children or I die see she wasn't trusting in God because she wasn't raised to even know God Laban had household idols. He worshipped pagan gods. He didn't worship the one true God. He was willing to see the one true God work in Jacob's life so that he could prosper. But he wasn't willing to honor God himself. And he hadn't raised his children to know how to do that. If you don't raise your children to know God, they're not just going to pick it up on their own. Leah and Rachel continued to fight like cats and dogs. And Jacob was caught in the middle. And Rachel said, give me children or I die. And Jacob said, who am I? I'm not God. It's not my fault. Rachel wasn't going to get children from God by blaming Jacob or by hating her sister. But we see that after a time, Rachel continued to try and come up with her own idea, just like Jacob did when he stole the birthright from Esau. Rachel said to Jacob, 
take my handmaiden and go in and sleep with her, and that will give me children. And you know what? It worked. It worked from the standpoint that she got two sons through her handmaiden. But you know what? She wasn't satisfied. You're never going to be satisfied when you compromise your integrity to try and get what you want in an unhealthy, unsanctioned by God way. If you go God's way, which is the way of integrity, everything is always worth the wait. Look at Jacob. He walked for 14 years, worked for Laban so that Rachel could be his wife because it was worth it to him and because he had covenanted to honor God. But his wives didn't know how to do that. Well, Leah had not had any children in a while, and she saw Rachel's handmaiden having children, so she gave her handmaiden to Jacob too and said, hey, have my handmaiden as well, and she also got two more sons. So now uh, Jacob had eight sons, and it wasn't enough. Leah wasn't satisfied. Rachel wasn't satisfied. When you compromise yourself morally, when you compromise your loyalty to God, when you compromise your obedience, your integrity, and when you're not doing what's morally right, it won't satisfy you. And they weren't satisfied. It wasn't until Rachel cried out to God that God was able to open her womb. It says that God remembered Rachel. And when God remembered Rachel, it says that God listened to her and opened her womb. She cried out to God, like Jacob had done after he, he fled his family. When we submit ourselves to God, when we repent of our sin, when we take responsibility, when we change our heart and we change our life, things change around us as well. And Rachel was able to conceive, and that's when she had the son of promise, Joseph. And Joseph was her first son, but even as she was giving birth to Joseph, she prophesied over her own life and said, and God will yet give me another son as well. Jacob couldn't be more pleased. Here was the son he had waited for. He loved Joseph more than his other children because he loved Rachel more than his w other wife and the handmaidens that he had also uh, been with who had become his wives as well. And Jacob compromised his integrity in the way that he favored Rachel and in the way that he favored Joseph. And all of Jacob's other children and family were able to see how he treated them differently. Well, God opened Leah's womb again, and she had another son, and she also had a daughter. And so it brought the grand total of children up to 12, 11 sons, and also one daughter. And Jacob was ready to leave Haran and to go home. He was ready for that peaceful uh, reuniting with his family that God had promised that he would give. And Laban said, look, no, 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 I don't want you to go. I want you to stay and I want you to work for me. What will your wages be? And Jacob said, it's time for me to think about my own family. For 14 years, he had worked just for Laban to get what he wanted. But integrity also understands a balance. And so the balance was is that Jacob knew it was time to now build up his own flocks so that he could independently take care of his children, his wives, his family. And so Jacob said, you're not giving me anything. See, integrity says I'm willing to earn it, not because it, does, it means we don't ever want anybody to give us anything or bless us, but because Jacob understood, he had discernment from God, that there were going to be strings attached. Anything Laban gave him, Laban was going to tell the world, see, I made Jacob. I prospered him. He's the, I'm the reason why he's wealthy instead of it being his hard work. And so Jacob had integrity, he had discernment from God, and he said, I will work for you. And I will work in your fields, and every, uh, every goat and every sheep that is speckled or marked or brown, basically it's compromised in the way that it looks, give me those livestock and I'll take those as mine and all of everything that is pure on the outside that's white and it's nice and looks good. You keep those. And Laban thought, ha, what a deal, man. I'm going to get all the best livestock. 
But if we had time, we would read the whole scripture and we would understand that the, the sheep that looked okay, that looked good on the outside, that were white, were weak. The livestock of Laban were weak. And the livestock of Jacob that didn't look great on the outside were actually strong and prosperous. A man or woman of integrity understands that it takes discernment from God to understand who somebody really is and what something really is and not to be limited by what our eyes see. God continued to bless Jacob because he was a man of integrity and God could not bless Laban because he was a man of deceit and manipulation and slander and envy. And one day God called out to Jacob and he said, it's time to go home. And God made the way for Jacob to go back home and to take all of his family with him. And along the way, he knew that he was going to have to see Esau again. And he sent ahead uh, someone to let Esau know that he was coming. And he got together a big gift of, of food and livestock and everything for his brother to, to send that first, to send the gift. And then after that, once again, Jacob's favoritism was the chink in the armor of his integrity. And we see in the word of God that as he was lining up his family to go toward Esau because he didn't know how Esau was going to respond to seeing him again, he sent the handmaidens and their children first. And then he sent Leah and her children next. And then he put Joseph and Rachel in the back. That way if there was a skirmish between the men, that hopefully Rachel and, jo and Joseph would be protected. A man of total integrity would not do these things because when we show favoritism, when we do things like this, we don't understand that what Jacob was sending the message to his other children and to his other wives was that Rachel and Joseph were the most important. And when we get into Joseph's life later, it won't be that big of a surprise to us that Joseph's brothers hated him. If you are a mom and dad, you will love your children differently, but you must be careful to never, ever treat one as a favorite because it was an opportunity for Satan to get in there to divide Joseph from his brothers. Because Leah and Rachel did not have a good relationship, they raised sons and daughters to not have a good relationship as well. Our integrity will not just reflect on our own life, but it is something that we pass down to the next generation. Raise children of integrity that can honor God. Well, Jacob, he, along the way, he sent everyone on ahead. And if we read in the word of God, if we had more time, but we're not studying Jacob's life, we're studying Joseph's, we see that Jacob wrestled with God and God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, the father of a mighty nation that would come through all of Jacob's sons and Jacob got up that morning and he went and he saw Esau far off and he had everybody all lined up and he saw that Esau had 400 men with him and he was a little nervous and then Esau ran oh, I love it oh I tell you it just gets me so emotional to see how God can work in the heart and the life of two brothers who had parted, not even, uh, you know, respectfully at all, but Esau wanted to kill Jacob. But you know what? A man of integrity repents of his sin, and God's able to work in his heart, and he's able to restore relationships. Maybe there are relationships in your family that have been fragmented for generations. Walk in integrity, and God can do a restoration in your family because that's his desire. And Esau and Jacob encountered each other and they hugged each other and they wept. And they blessed each other. And Jacob was restored to his brother Esau and he also got to see his father Isaac again. When we repent of our sin, if we do what 1 Peter tells us and we lay aside all of those old things that we used to do, you know, there are things in your past maybe that even shame you. A man of integrity says, that's who I was, 
but that's not who I am now. And I live a different life. I honor God. And when you honor God in all things, God is able to work in every area of your life and bring you back to restoration. And that restoration is wide sweeping and it's powerful. A man of integrity makes peace with God, honors God with his life, and then God is able to make even his enemies to bless him. And that's what God did in the relationship of Jacob and Esau. And so Joseph and all of his brothers and his father came home. They came home to Canaan. And on the way, Rachel was pregnant with her younger son, Benjamin, and she gave birth. And shortly after the birth of Benjamin, Rachel passed away. And Joseph was alone. See how the envy and the bitterness and the resentment that Rachel had for her sister, how it caused such a division that in that time when Joseph was mourning, when Jacob was mourning for his beloved wife, Joseph felt so isolated and alone because he couldn't rely on his 10 older brothers and his aunt Leah couldn't be a second mom to him. All he had was the favoritism of his father. When we compromise our integrity, we can create problems for the next generation that they have to try and work out themselves. Well, there was also another problem going on in Jacob's oldest son, Reuben. Right after this, we see in the word of God that Reuben makes a really bad and rebellious choice. And he sleeps with one of his father's concubines. He does it to try and show a rebellion, to usurp his father's authority, and to reject his father as the leader of the household. And it costs Reuben dearly. Instead of having integrity and waiting for his inheritance, he tried to become the leader of the household even when his father was still alive. And it cost him the birthright. He was no longer considered the firstborn son. Now, it didn't pass to Simeon, the secondborn from Leah. Instead, it passed to the only other firstborn son in the family. The birthright became Joseph's. And that is another reason why Joseph's brothers hated him. But Joseph decided to live an integrity, a life of integrity before God. That's the end of our time together today. But when we come back next week, we're going to get into the life of Joseph and see how he overcame losing his mom, having the hatred of his brothers, to become a man of integrity who followed God consistently in all he said and in all he did. Be a man or woman of integrity. Seek the pure milk of the word. Grow up into your salvation and see the incredible things that God can do in your life when you walk every day in submission to him. Thank you for joining us for today's teaching. We look forward to studying the word with you again next time. In the meantime, if you want to check out any of our other video teachings, podcasts, daily devotional blogs, or to access the Melissa Silvis Ministries event calendar, you can friend us on Facebook at Melissa Silvis or at Melissa Silvis Ministries to the Nations with Love. You can also check out more information about our ministry by going to melissasilvis.com. May God bless you as you continue to seek Him every day.